Today is a very exciting day because we have never done what we are doing today with Dr. Maslow's work. The idea of sharing a concert with an artist who is here. I mean, the exciting thing about Leica is we always tell people, well, you know, composers are not dead old people. And when we have uh, Composers Alliance concerts, it's always exciting to know that, yes, you can go to meet the composers and say hello to them and talk to them about why do you do what you do, uh, if you would like. <laughs> you might get an answer. And uh, uh, today we have an opportunity to meet an artist whose works fill the room. And the concept that we had was to present a program where we would, as composers, have a chance to look at his work, consider his work, and think about how musically we can share those ideas. I'm, I'm not using the word interpret, because that means something, but it's really a way of sharing thought. Because musicians and artists always have always had shared thoughts. I mean, you know, we talk about, uh, don't get me started being my college teacher world, because we talk about Debussy, and uh, Debussy was probably the only true Impressionist musician. He, he wanted to be an Impressionist, but he understood what the artists were doing, and he was able to bring across the color, the light, the time, the, 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 all of these wonderful things into his musical work. And that's what we were hoping very much to do today, to share the feeling, the intentions, and the personal feeling of the artist in musical ways. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not, it's, it's very unusual, it's very unique. I was going to say difficult, but it, it is not as difficult as it seems. It's more exciting. I'm very happy to see all of you here. Uh, I'd like to just go from left to right and talk a little bit about the paintings and the composers. Uh, this is uh, called Surreal Garden. And Herb Deutsch has written a piece on that called Preamble and Fugue. And the fugue is very contrapuntal, and I feel that something about that painting has a lot of contra counterpoint in it. So Herb chose that. Uh, this one up here is called Four in the Desert. Now you can see uh, it's uh, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, and there are two burrows. And up in the uh, right-hand corner, uh, top corner are the windmills. Uh, this one underneath is called the Steps of San Gim Gimignano. Now San Gimignano is a very beautiful city in the middle of Tuscany. And if you t look at it from a distance, it looks like a small Manhattan because there's all these magnificent bell towers. It's a very old city. It uh, was built back around 1100 AD. Uh, this particular, and uh, uh, Margaret Richter will uh, have a piece uh, based on that, and Leo Kraft will have a piece based on the uh, uh, Four of the Desert. This next painting is, was chosen by two of our composers, Dana Richardson, called Falling Sky, and Herbert Feldman, and they liked the color and the abstraction of that particular beautiful painting. This is Oregon Beach, which uh, Jane Leslie has written a piece for. The one under it is called Alhambra Passion. And two, myself and, uh, and uh, uh, Abraham Sternklar have uh, chosen to write pieces on that. And uh, Abraham's piece is called Moorish Dance. And uh, the Alhambra, as you know, is a Moorish pass palace. So it, it fits right in. And I've written a piece called, actually with the title of, this, of the thing, called Alhambra Passion. And uh, if any of you people know the work of Manuel de Falla, a great Spanish composer, I kind of was inspired by both by the painting and by his music. And the last large painting here is uh, Juliet and Romeo, which uh, Julie Mandel 
uh, has written a piece. And by the way, her real name, for, uh, her name that she was uh, christened with was uh, Juliet. So uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Milt Mazur, yeah. who's going to talk about it. I'm going to limit my remarks to a few things. The importance of Darwinian evolution affecting the arts, that would be a little bit unusual for this kind of thing. The importance of the generative process and the arts, and I also will add a word about my paintings. When I began to make artworks some years ago, I couldn't help but wonder why I and so many other people are drawn to do so. And the answer came when I came across a book called The Art Instinct. It's by Dennis Dutton, who is a distinguished professor of the philosophy of art, and who explored and documented the controversial idea that artistic creativity and the aesthetic experience, including audience interaction, have been conditioned by Darwinian evolution over several million years. Dutton looked at artistic virtuosity and the audience application of the arts as evolutionary adaptations, not just social and cultural add-ons. Dutton thought that the variety of different human cultures and art forms are comparable because they're spurred by the same genetic origins. Although he did, however, acknowledge that uh, uh, cultural elements have been added on to evolution. Um, he conceives of the adaptations um, uh, uh, affecting the uh, artwork and the um, uh, uh, aspects of art, the, the virtuosity, but he does concede that the, uh, there are byproducts, and he gives us an example that one evolutionary adaptation was the production of language, but that a, a byproduct of that has been, of course, printing and TV and the computer and things of that nature. The arts have many functions, often involving communications within ourselves and between ourselves, telling stories, communicating ideas, and communicating emotions, stimulating our imagination. They help to define our individual and collective expressions of meaning. We use artistic metaphor to bridge between our rational brains and our intuitive brains. Second point I wanted to discuss briefly is generativity. Uh, there is a difference between creativity and generativity. The creativity that gets passed on to other people, that multiplies, that reproduces, um, as we progressively develop our lives, that is something that Eric Erickson described, and many people will remember the eight ages of man. The arts are a mechanism for this generative process, much more than just creativity. And I also wanted to say a word about the evolution of my own paintings. I started out sculpting and then I tried two-dimensional painting, and when I realized I wanted to combine the two techniques, I began to make bar-relief sculptures, sometimes adding collage elements, and I painted them. And I found that that third dimension brought out a sense of identity, and addition of color brought on a certain amount of nuance. The subjects that produced emotional saturation in me as I saw them were the ones I chose to paint. Emotional saturation is a very interesting term that Dennis Dutton uses. It's, uh, I guess, equivalent to epiphany. Now, understanding the origins of our aesthetic and imaginative lives is an excellent thing to try to do, but the question has been asked, will that process rob the arts of their subjective appeal? And Dutton says, that the situation is analogous to understanding our genetically determined love for sweet and fatty things. That doesn't rob cheesecake of its delicious taste. So now we'll just go on. We have the opportunity to listen to what our composers and musical players have created for us 
to stir our imagination and to stir our sense of connectedness.
Thank you. 
Thank you.